Hello, everyone. We're going to get to give it another minute, let people go ahead and get in, and then we'll get started. Pretty excited about today's presentation, The Life of a Hard Money Loan. All right, we are live. We are live on Facebook. Um, all right, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about the life of a hard money loan. We have some great guest speakers, uh, Dan Najarian and Hussein Skyke. Um, before we get started, just a few things I want to mention. So what is a self-directed IRA? So a self-directed IRA has actually been around since the 1970s. It gives you the ability to self-direct your investments and choose how you want to invest your money. You're not limited to just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. There's a big variety of asset classes that you can invest in. Most people don't know that they can do that. Um, so the power of self-direction, it gives you the ability to diversify your portfolio into alternative assets. And I'm going to cover quite a few of those. Um, also, the tax savings. You can invest with IRAs, health savings accounts, education savings accounts, solo 401ks. So there's quite a few vehicles that you can use. You want to make sure you're qualified for those plans, but I'm going to go into a little bit more depth than those. Not only that, if you're already investing in things like real estate or doing private lending, why not do it in an IRA where you can save on taxes? It can be tax deferred or tax free for you. So these are the different types of plans you can use to self-direct. First is your personal plans. You have your Roth IRA, your traditional IRA. Um, they're both IRAs. They both have similar contribution limits. So $6,000 a year, you can contribute to an IRA, um, a Roth or traditional. If you're over the age of 50, there's an additional $1,000 contribution called a catch-up contribution. So it's a small chunk of change you can contribute each year. But if you keep doing it year after year, you're going to grow it. Not only that, if you make investments into the right and opportunities, that's how you're going to grow those IRAs. Now, the Roth is going to grow tax exempt versus the traditional IRA is going to grow tax deferred. So what does that mean? Well, the traditional IRA, it's tax deferred when you make your contributions. Once you retire after the age 59 and a half and you start taking distributions out, that's when you're taxed on that. So it's based on whatever your tax bracket is at that time that you take that distribution. Now, you're not required to take distributions after 59 and a half until you reach the age 72 years old, then you're required to start taking those distributions. Now, the Roth IRA does not have those. They're called RMDs. You can keep that Roth IRA working for you and invest it as long as you like, and you don't have to take those required minimum distributions. Um, now, you do want to wait till you're 59 and a half to take any distributions out. If you take them out early, there could be a 10% penalty. Um, but they're both powerful vehicles. You have to get with your CPA, figure out which one works best for you. Then you have employer plans. You have your solo 401k, your SEP IRA, and your simple IRA. I'm a fan of the solo 401k. This is great. The only way to be qualified for the solo 401k is if you are self-employed with no employees in any of your business entities. If you meet those qualifications, the solo 401k has a lot higher contribution limits. You can contribute $20,500 as the employee of your business. And then you also have an employer match component in there. The maximum you can contribute is $61,000 and that's combined with your employee and employer contribution. But if you're over the age of 50, there's a catch-up contribution of another $6,500 you can contribute to that plan. Then you have your SEP IRA. The SEP IRA is great for anyone with small businesses. Um, typically people like doctors, attorneys, they like this plan because it also has high contribution limits. And this is the employer side. Up to 25% of your earned income can be contributed to the SEP IRA. Um, so $61,000 is a maximum contribution to the SEP IRA. And then your simple IRA, great for small businesses as well. Um, there is a 3% mandatory match. Um, you can contribute up to $13,500 to the simple IRA and then match 3% whatever your employees salaries are to that plan. And then you guys, if you all, you know, open a simple IRA, you could even partner on deals together. Say there's a piece of real estate or something that everyone wants to invest in at your firm or your company. Well, if each of you have a simple IRA, well, now you can each contribute to that pot and buy that real estate. So that's what I've seen people do with the simple IRAs, or you can even partner on, you know, uh, private loan or something like that, or buy some mortgage notes. So there's quite a few things that you can do in there. Then you have your specialty plans. So health savings accounts. Most people don't know that you can self-direct this health savings account. The cool thing with this health savings account is 
it's kind of like a Roth and a traditional IRA, but it's only meant for medical purposes, but it can be invested. So whatever you contribute to your health savings account is going to be tax deferred. And then when you take those distributions out of your health savings account, it's going to be tax exempt. Um, so that's pretty powerful. Um, the contribution limits are around $7,600 if you have a family plan. Um, it's a little smaller if you're an individual with the health savings account, um, but you can use that account and you can partner with some of the IRAs and you might already have opened. Um, and then you have your Coverdell education savings account. So the contributions for this plan are only $2,000 a year. You can open accounts for your kids or grandkids, and it's a college savings account. It could be used for anything as far as uh, tuition, books, laptops, internet. I mean, anything that is education related, it can be used for. But, you know, if you have small kids right now and you want to start saving for them, you might want to look into the Coverdell because that plan can be invested into these alternative assets versus a plan like a 529, which is a government plan that can't be diversified into the alternative investments that we're going to cover today. So these are the most common types of investments clients will make. Real estate's probably the most popular and there's a lot of things in real estate you can do. So you can invest in things like foreclosures, tax liens, apartment syndications, multifamily syndications, same thing. Um, so real estate option contracts, condos, land, commercial property. You can even invest in offshore real estate, which I'm seeing a lot of clients doing as well. Then you have your promissory notes. You can invest in secured notes or unsecured notes. The best thing about the notes is a pretty passive investment and you get to negotiate what the terms of that note look like. Then you have your private entities. Um, probably the next most common thing next to real estate. So investing in anything like LLCs, startup companies, um, syndications, funds, anything like that would fall under the private entities. Um, anything that's a pre-IPO, which I've seen people doing, um, something that might go public later on, I've seen people invest in those. Um, tech companies, there's, there's so many things out there that fall under the private entities world. Um, and then cryptocurrency, we're seeing clients doing as well. Um, when they have that money that's just sitting there in cash, they want to put it somewhere. I'm seeing them put it in cryptocurrency. So things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin um, are some of the common ones we see client investing. But there's a wide plethora of cryptocurrency out there. Definitely before you make any investments, you want to do your due diligence. Um, get with your CPA, get with your financial advisor or attorney, whoever you need to consult with. Because New View, we are not financial advisors, CPAs, or attorneys. We do educate you on how self-directed IRAs work and what the rules are, but we cannot give you that financial advice. So it really comes down to you doing your own due diligence, figure out what investment vehicle is going to work best for you and which type of investments you want to make using your self-directed IRA. All right. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dan Najarian. He uh, and I did a recent interview. I don't know if you saw it, but it was really good. He's a plethora of knowledge. A few things about Dan. He's represented buyers, sellers, and lenders in over 900 real estate transactions. So he's got a lot of experience in the industry and he is with crowd lending. Um, also, he brought in his business development uh, rep. His name is Hussein Skyke. And Hussein has successfully originated and brokered over $250 million in private real estate loans across New England. So they've got some great experience, great opportunity for you guys to pick their brains and ask some questions. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and bring them on. Hey, Dan, how's it going? Good, how you doing? Hussein, nice to meet you. Likewise, how's it going? Thanks for joining us today, guys. Um, so I know you got a presentation, you got a lot of information you want to get out there. So I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and get started. I'm gonna take a step back and then I'll join you for the Q&A, okay? Sure, sounds great. Sounds good. As, uh, as you were told, my name is Dan Najari and I'm the CEO of Crowd Lending. Uh, Hussein Skakey is here, uh, one of my business development guys. Um, Crowd lending, by way of background, uh, opened back in 2015. Uh, we started making loans and raising capital in 2016. Uh, we've done about a quarter of a billion in loans uh, and raised about 30 million uh, to our balance sheet. And, and our business model, uh, and we're going to discuss that today, is, is hard money. Hard money loans are used in real estate for investors, whether it's a single family fix and flip, a condo conversion up here in the Northeast or any sort of real estate value add play, some people will come and use hard money loans. Uh, we act just like the bank. Uh, we take a first, first mortgage on the property. We'll get into how that works. But one thing I wanna mention and, and make sure that uh, everybody understands is sort of the, the term hard money. Um, it's not something to run from. Uh, I look at hard money as an alternative to your conventional lending. So your Bank of America or up here in, in the Northeast, the Citizens Bank or customer's bank or something along those lines. The term hard, 
a lot of people have a different uh, definition of it. For me, our terms are certainly a little bit harder in the sense that they're more expensive than a conventional lender. But at the end of the day, it's actually easier to use our money uh, and, and more profitable for a lot of our borrowers. So I don't want anybody out there uh, that's thinking about getting in, into real estate or thinking about using a hard money lender to be frightened by the term hard money, um, given it's, uh, you know, given the term uh, that you hear, or sometimes you hear it as a negative connotation. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'd like to jump into the presentation. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Hussein and let him sort of give you an overview. Um, this is another slide and, and it'll touch ba uh, basically on who crowd lending is and who I am and who Hussein, but you're not here to listen to us talk about ourselves. You want to learn about a hard money loan. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how borrowers find their deals, how we find the deals. And once those deals are sourced and located, what happens then as you go through the process of dealing with a hard money lender? So with that, I'll turn it over to Hussein. Thank you, Dan. All right, guys. So there's two uh, there's two aspects here of, of sourcing these deals and, and finding them. Our client first has to find the deal before we can talk about how we go about finding our clients. So a lot of our clients are real estate developers, builders, flippers. The fix and flip loan is probably our most sought after product. And the way that these guys are going about finding these deals, or I should say these guys and gals, obviously number one is the MLS, right? Properties that are on the market. As you guys know, we're in a climate right now where it is incredibly competitive to win offers on properties that are on the market. You're sort of dealing with a large pool of buyers and a very small pool of supply. But that is one way that these uh, developers find deals. The second way is, is more attractive to them because they're finding them off market and that's through wholesalers. So what a wholesaler does, their entire job is to hunt down and find off market real estate properties that are for sale. That could be through many different ways, which we'll get into in a second. But what they'll do is they'll get the property under agreement and then they'll seek out a home flipper or real estate developer to then buy the contract from them or have it assigned to them for a fee. That's a very attractive way for a potential uh, home flipper or developer to find deals because somebody else is sort of doing all the work and then they're you know, essentially negotiating a fee there to buy that contract from them. These guys are negotiating and networking with real estate attorneys, probate attorneys. Probate to me is an excellent way to find an off-market real estate property. Obviously, there's a situation where a family or an estate needs to sell or liquidate. And if you have relationships with, uh, with some of these attorneys and estates, you're able to negotiate it. You know, you're, you can go to them and say, I'm qualified, you've done business with me before, I'm a cash buyer. And oftentimes you're able to get yourself a really good deal off market. Notice the trend here, I keep saying off market because the off market deals are actually the ones with the bigger profit margins. When you're dealing with a hundred buyers at an open house, if you end up getting that property under agreement, getting your offer accepted, you probably were the one that offered the most money. So just keep in mind that this is a business where a lot of off-market properties are, uh, are going under, under agreement and they actually have bigger profit margins. Another way these clients find deals is through direct mailings. You can buy lists out there uh, that are sold that, that sort of, you design the list. So I can say, I want a, a list of properties in Massachusetts that have not transacted within 10 to 20 years. The average, the average American family is moving every seven to 10 years. So if a property hasn't changed hands in a greater period of time, chances are it's either in disarray or something happened that the family just decided to, to sit on the property for a while. It could be somebody passed away, it could be a divorce, it could be a whole host of things but you can directly mail these clients and a lot of our, these sellers and a lot of our clients actually do that. So they'll have thousands of addresses every month that they just continually mail and try to uh, 
get those homeowners to sell their properties. And obviously there's advertising like the We Buy Houses franchises, things like that. Some of our clients own We Buy Houses franchise, which essentially is a company that does all these things I just listed. And then if I wanted to buy their franchise, I would pay them you know, monthly or per lead and things like that. So that's how our clients find their deals. How do we go about finding our clients? The number one way I think is word of mouth and networking. So you have boots on the ground and we have boots on the ground in the markets that, that we're looking to lend in. And you know, there's real estate events, there's real estate meetups, real estate investment clubs and seminars all over every major city in the United States. So we attend those and then the network sort of builds on itself and, and business starts to get referred over and over again. That is the number one way I've seen over 10 years of finding these clients. The second way for me, and I think for, for everyone at, at our company, is social media. So we're all over social media. It's an it's a avenue that I think is underutilized. I've actually found clients and closed deals off social media, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Um, that's where a lot of these potential flippers, that's where they're showcasing their, their flips and their properties on social media, then we go in there and target them. And finally, direct mail. What we like to do is go through the public records. So every real estate transaction in the country, I believe, is, is public information. So we go through the public record. We have our targeted, you know, who our competitors are. We look up who, who has borrowed from them. And then we go ahead and, and directly target those clients as well. So we're sending them, whether it's a letter in the mail or a postcard or a cold call outreach, those, the combination of those three allows us to find fix and flippers, real estate developers, and even wholesalers that have relationships with, uh, with flippers and builders. And that's how, that's how we source our deals. That's how we find our clients. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Dan. He's going to talk about how we go about after we find a client, how we present terms, move from term sheet to closing. And, and I just want to stop quick and make note of why this is an important uh, discussion. Uh, certainly that first part and going forward for anybody that's considering uh, using a self-directed IRA or one of the vehicles that uh, was uh, addressed in the opening. You're not only investing in the product, which is the actual loan that's being made, but you're also investing in the company that uh, sources that loan and services that loan and ultimately gets that loan paid back so that there's no principal loss and you can enjoy your interest. So when you're looking at direct, doing a self-directed IRA into one of these um, real estate uh, investments, make sure you know who the uh, sponsors are or who the operators are of the, of the company that you're investing in. So now, uh, now we've got uh, a deal in place. Uh, the borrower has come to us, the buyer and the bo slash borrower has come to us and said, hey, we need a loan. We start to negotiate terms. And now you're gonna see uh, what we produce. The first document that we produce is a term sheet. I put it up here uh, and I highlighted um, sort of the areas that you wanna pay attention to as you go through a term sheet, if, if you're the borrower here. Um, and this is the first, contract between the borrower and the lender, in this case, it's crowd lending, uh, as to what the terms of the deal, terms of the loan are going to be. So you hi I highlighted all the areas. The important areas are the purchase price. You've got your loan amount. Now, the first thing that probably jumps out to people is, wow, you got a purchase price that's less than the loan amount. But if you le read a little further into that loan amount paragraph, you'll see that the initial disbursement is less than the purchase price. So we're gonna, you know, most lenders will fund a certain amount of the purchase price. And then there's, uh, there's additional later on, and I'll show it to you, there's additional money that's gonna be dispersed as part of the construction or rehab, depending on what the project is, there's gonna be some additional disbursements made and Hussein will touch on that later. So again, these are the things you wanna look, look for to make sure they're correct. Because at the end of the day, this is in fact a contract. Is the purchase price right? Is the loan amount right? Uh, is the LTV, the targeted LTV correct? Do you have, do they have the address correct? Uh, again, the collateral, you'll see their first mortgage. Again, we sit in the same seat 
most people that aren't familiar with uh, um, commercial loans or, or fix and flip loans, we sit in the same seat as if you went down and you bought your first home and you used Bank of America and you got a loan, first mortgage. So if something was to, was to go wrong, we could foreclose on the property and we'd have a priority on any monies received as a result of the auction. So you check the address, getting further into it, you check the cost and fees that are associated with the deal. You check the interest payments. You make sure that uh, all of the terms, again, looking down interest reserve. So if there is an interest reserve, which is essentially part of the loan is being set aside to make the interest payments through the life of the loan. You have to really go through all of these areas in the term sheet and make sure they're correct. Again, here's what I spoke about earlier, the use of proceeds. You really have a breakdown here. It talks about what's gonna be funded at the closing. It talks about what's gonna be funded for the, for the renovations. And then it talks about what's, what it's gonna be funded for the uh, interest reserve for a total of, of the loan amount that you saw on page one. So you wanna make sure that all that information is correct so that uh, when you do sign it down here at the last page, you're entering a contract now, you've accepted the terms. And if those terms aren't right, you're bound by those terms, just like the lender is bound by those terms. So now we've got a, the term sheet signed, the deal is ready to go, and we're gonna start going through our underwriting process. And as part of our underwriting process and any lender's underwriting process, they're gonna check background. They're gonna to wanna to make sure that the borrower has decent credit. They're gonna to wanna to make sure that the borrower has the proper liquidity to handle the deal. Most important with a hard money loan is going to be the asset. And the asset is the house, the three family, the commercial property, the piece of land with its entitlements, whatever it may be, that's the asset. We want to know what the value of that asset is. So we're going to go ahead and order an appraisal. And an appraisal in our situation is just like an appraisal if you got, went and bought your, the home that you live in. It's a third party evaluation of the value of that property. And we do a two pronged appraisal. We do an as is appraisal. So what's the property worth today when we sign this term sheet? And what's the property going to be worth based on the construction that's being com completed by you, the borrower, uh, over the life of the loan. So what's it gonna be at the end when we're fully dispersed? If I go back on this particular loan, we'd be fully dispersed, oops, we'd be fully dispersed at 2.2 million. We wanna make sure that we're no greater than 70% of the after repair value once that 2.2 million is dispersed. So quick math, probably somewhere in the 2.8 zone, 2.8 area, 2.9 is, is uh, about what we want that property to come in at. Don't quote me on that, I didn't do the math. It's quick in my head. So now we got the term sheet. We did the underwriting. We got the appraisal back. We ran your background check. We did all the things that we did and we're now everybody's comfortable to move forward. And now the next most important document, one of the most important documents that you'll see is right here, a settlement statement. Um, now what you see for a borrower on the right hand, on the left hand side are your numbers. And the things that you want to look out for as you go through a settlement statement, let's see if I can scroll down here. Yep. So up top, make sure the names are correct. I just had a matter of fact, I just had a settlement statement come across my desk on a deal that we're funding. And the name of the seller on the settlement statement didn't match the name of the seller on the deed. So that's something you got to look out for. Make sure that all the information, your name, addresses, you know, who's closing the loan, all of that stuff. So the buyer is on the left-hand side and, and we'll come back to this exact document later on in the presentation to talk about what's on the right-hand side, but I just want you to ignore that for now. You've got your purchase price, that's the 155. You've got your settlement charges, which I'll get into later on. Here's your construction holdback, which again, matches what you saw on the term sheet, right? So you got your purchase price matches, your construction holdback matches. You go down to line 202, you've got your loan amount. That also matches what's on the term sheet. So we're going, we're going pretty good here. Some of these other numbers are adjustments that are made. If there's rent that's been paid on the property, there's gotta be an adjustment back from the buyer to the seller. Taxes have to be adjusted. You can see that in line 106 and carrying over to line 104. So as you scroll down, you'll see at the end of the day, cash to close, cash from borrower here. That's how much this particular borrower had to bring to the closing, 309,000. And that was when you add up all the numbers and go through everything, that's the bottom line. Now, his closing costs, and I'll point it out one more time here, 
You've got your settlement charges, uh, 103 here. Line 103 is your settlement charges. That's a carryover number from page two. And I'll walk you through page two. Thank you, Hussein. To see how you got to that number. So if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, it's black, it's, it's got whited out here, but essentially that number that you saw will carry over. And it's an accumulation of all of these figures. You have a $44,000 origination fee to crowd lending. You've got a loan processing fee. You've got an interest reserve. Again, that number matches the number you saw on the term sheet. You've got your appraisal fee, which we talked about. You've got your daily interest. Okay, this, is a, this, this can be a little bit of an interesting or confusing situation. Your daily interest, as most of, if you don't know, or if you have a mortgage, you do know, you pay your mortgage in arrears. And what I mean by that is your June 1st payment covers the month of May. Unlike when you rent a piece of property, your June 1st payment covers the month of June. Looking forward, you always pay your monthly mortgage payment is, is, is to cover the month previous. Makes sense, right? Because you borrowed the money during that month. Now you have to pay it back. Borrow the money during that month, you pay it back month over month. So if you look at this, you've got your daily interest from the closing date, which is 429. I understand it's a little bit fuzzy here. To the end of the month, which is 5-1, that's two days at roughly $398 for a total of 797. Now, what this means and why this is important is that your interest payment on May 1st has been paid and your first mortgage payment, if this was your settlement statement, wouldn't be until June 1st. So something to keep in mind. Scroll down here to the 1100, you've got your legal fees, your title insurance. Title insurance is a conversation for another day, but my one piece of advice on title insurance is to buy it. It can save you a big, big headache when you go sell the property, buy title insurance. Um, you've got your recording fees, as, as Hussein stated earlier. Anytime a property goes uh, uh, gets sold uh, in uh, most states, probably all states, at least the states that we deal in, you've got to go record that at the Registry of Deeds. The state's charging you fees for that. All right? So this is a settlement statement. After you've reviewed this, each page of it, these are some additional fees, the prior payoff. This is for the mostly for the seller down here. We'll get into that when we talk about it as a seller. You sign this document and now you are the proud owner of a piece of property that needs $800,000 worth of work. And you've partnered with, with a, a lender to get that money. And I'm gonna let Hussein step in and talk to you about how things get funded and how a lender in our shoes, and this is important again for the people out there that are uh, investing, via their self-directed IRA, and we have a bunch of them. Why this is important is because of what I mentioned earlier, where, oh my goodness, we have a $2.2 million loan, but you bought the property for 1.5, you're already upside down. Well, not really. And we'll explain why and how we manage that risk and make sure that our loan to value, which is our the amount of our loan dispersed as in comp a comparison to the value of the property, how we control that uh, those metrics, through our funding and risk management. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I think, uh, it, you know, if I was investing in this, I, the, the main thing I would be concerned about is how is my money going to be protected? What, how, how is the risk going to be managed? And hold on one. Let's see if you can maybe make it smaller and then I might have. Okay, so this is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important documents in the entire process. This is the construction budget. You noticed on the term sheet and the settlement statement that there was $800,000 in construction. So you see this budget matches that as well. This is something we require from the client prior to closing. We review this to make sure that it makes sense and nothing odd stands out about it. After doing a quarter of a billion dollars of these types of loans, we sort of have an idea in the markets that we lend in what these budgets should look like. And the way we manage the risk is that that money is not given to the client upfront. So as Dan was referring uh, on the term sheet, how the allocation of funds upfront, 
was within the, the value of the property, it's really not, right? So we have $800,000 that's held back. The loan was 2.2, 800 of that is held back. And we're looking at a future value of $2.93 million. So how do we manage this risk is by making sure the construction money is only given to the client on a reimbursement schedule for the work that's been completed. So that's all a fancy way of me saying the client does some work, they get reimbursed for the work that's been done. So if we're gonna look at this budget, line item number one is plans, engineering, and permitting. A project this size, $800,000 worth of construction, it is not uncommon for those three items to be roughly $50,000. So that's what the client has in their budget here. That money is not given to the client until these items are done. So for example, let's say the full set of construction plans cost $20,000. The client can then submit for a draw as long as he sends us these plans. We can then say, okay, we can release from this line item for $20,000. And you can, you can look through all of these, right? You've got the plans and engineering and the permitting, that's step one. Then you move on to demo and then framing and siding and roofing and all these items have their own line items. So if the new roof has been put on, we make sure we send our in-house inspector or third-party inspector, depending on uh, what the deal calls for, to go verify that the work is done. We're not just taking the borrower's word for it. We actually send somebody out there to make sure that that work is done. So if a client wants to put in a draw request for this roof line item here, it's $25,000. So we make sure our inspector goes out there, takes pictures of it, submits it to us with a report and this spreadsheet. And as long as it's done, we can release that $25,000. And this allows us to stay shoulder to shoulder with the client throughout the entire time. It allows us to have sort of our grasp on the construction and to manage it. We never want to be in a situation where we've given more construction money than construction has actually been done. At that point, you're over leveraged and it's, it's not a situation we would want to be in for our loans or for our investors funds. And I think to me, this in combination with the underwriting that we do, where we're getting it appraised, where we're checking the borrower's background, where we're making sure these are borrowers that have experience in real estate, the combination of those three are really the key to our risk management. Just wanna make sure of not So you can see here on this sheet, there's room here for multiple draws. The, the average construction project is going to have anywhere from four to eight draws on average. A single family may have four to five, and a project like this, which is a multifamily condo conversion, will probably have closer to eight. But all these line items here have been verified by us prior to closing. These numbers are numbers that make sense to us. And Again, the money is not given to the borrower before the work is done. And I think that should sort of allow everyone a sigh of relief to know that you know, this money is not going anywhere. The borrower can't just disappear once you give him the money. Because once we release that $25,000 for roofing, yes, the money's out the door, but that now becomes an asset because that roof is done. It's a concrete item that we can, we go there, we verify and you can actually touch it. This is how you do all of the construction throughout the entire process. And then at the very end, once everything is done, you submit for your final draw or the client will submit for their final draw where we make sure the project is 100% complete. All the inspections have been signed off on and there's been a certificate of occupancy and this thing is done, ready to go at that point. Congratulations, the work is done. You can list the property on the market. Some people like to list it before the work is done. I tend not to recommend that, but the property's on the market 
And now the client is looking to sell it to another buyer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give the camera back to Dan to talk about that end sale process. As far as the uh, this construction process and, and managing that risk for our investors, I think it's important to note that sort of in the back of our mind, what we're trying to accomplish here is as money goes out the door, we know that money is going into the property. So if halfway through the construction process, the borrower decides to walk away or, or something happens, God forbid, to that borrower and we have to take over that project, we would still have enough money within our budget within his budget and our loan amount to finish that project and then realize the profits at the end. You know, we're not in the, you know, we don't, we're not in the game of taking over these properties just so that we can make all the money. We want our borrowers to make money. We want our investors to make money. And if those two things happen, then we make money. Um, so, but we do want to have the proper precautions and, and the proper safeties in place to make sure that if we do have to take over a property, we're in good stead to do that. So now the, as, as Hussein said, the property is complete. You've dealt with the town. The borrower has dealt with the town and getting rough inspections and, and, and final inspections and the landscaping is done and the grass is cut and you're gonna put a sign uh, on the front to sell the property. And this is, this is the most exciting time because now you're starting to see the fruits of your labor. Uh, we like it too, because we can see that the money is gonna be paid back which allows us to go out and originate a new loan, which allows us to keep the income streams coming in and making sure that our investors, uh, whether it's a self-directed IRA or directly into our other products are, are getting their returns. So, so it's always an exciting time. Uh, I always like the beginning of a project and then the end of a project, the beginning of the project moves very quickly. Demo goes very quickly. Framing moves very quickly. When you get into the finish work, it slows down. Uh, and then at the end, if the property is done prop done well, and priced uh, correctly in the market that it's in, it'll sell quickly and you can move on to the sale process. So in the sale process, the first document you're gonna receive uh, is an offer sheet. I'm not sure we have one up. Um, make that smaller. Oh, we got a, so we have a purchase and sale, but even before the purchase and sale, you're gonna receive an offer sheet. And I would liken the offer to the term sheet that you received from us, um, that you received from us at the start of the loan. It's gonna have the, the operative terms of your deal to sell the property. Uh, the name of the buyer, the purchase price, the time of the, of the sale, or the time and date of the sale, uh, the, the deposit schedule, the, any contingencies, whether they're mortgage contingencies, inspection contingencies, uh, or title contingencies. Those are all gonna be spelled out in the offer. That offer, so again, just like you went through the term sheet or a borrower who's going through the term sheet with us, they should go through that one because that is also a contract. Once that offer sheet is signed by all parties, then you'll move into the purchase and sale agreement. Uh, and again, purchase and sale agreement carries over all of the information, but I wanna point out some of the operative terms. A lot of these are very standard language. I advise you and any buyer and seller of real estate, make sure you hire a qualified, real estate attorney that has seen a thousand of these PNSs who knows what to look for, uh, knows if anybody's trying to sneak a fastball by them uh, and, and make sure that you're right, you're, uh, you're protected and your rights are, are represented. So uh, we just kind of sort of piggyback on the deal that we've been talking about. You've got your, you've got a description of the land would go up here. We blacked out all the information to protect the innocent here, but you'd see your name, your seller name, your buyer name in paragraph one, you'd see the address of the property in, in, in two. You see some standard language about the things that are included in that sale in paragraphs three, paragraphs four, five, and six sort of talk about the title of the property. And when I say title, I mean, are there any mortgages out there outstanding that need to be paid off? Are there any tax liens that need to be paid off? Does the person signing this document have uh, ownership of that property and the right to sell it? So that, that all of that thing would be done, all of the titles work would be done again by a qualified attorney. Uh, you have your purchase price down in paragraph seven. You want to make sure that that matches what was in the offer sheet. You're getting into your deposit schedule at the bottom of paragraph seven, the top of this page here. Paragraph eight, again, talks about the date and time of the closing. These are the operative terms, right? When are we selling? What are we selling for? How much of a deposit are we going to get? And then you get into sort of the, the, the legal meat and potatoes of the purchase and sale agreement. And I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but it talks about the condition of the property, the condition of the title, 
the fact that if you accept the deed as the buyer, you're take, you know, it's a buyer beware type of situation pretty much once that deed transfers uh, hands. So you want to make sure that you do your due, due diligence before that closing. And again, uh, having the proper real estate agent, having the proper uh, real estate attorney in your corner uh, can be helpful. And again, having the right lender, right? Uh, as I pointed out earlier, when we talked about, um, when we talked about uh, the information on a settlement statement being correct, I'm not that guy's lawyer. I'm just, I'm the lender. He's my client as, as a lender. My background as being an attorney, a real estate attorney who's closed a thousand of these loans, I knew where to look. I saw it. I caught it for him. So he didn't catch himself in any sort of fraud situation. So again, just things to consider as you're, as you're doing one of two things, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, either borrowing hard money and or investing in a hard money product, you want to make sure that the team and the sponsors that you have, uh, that where you're putting your money is, is well-versed in what's going on in the real estate world. Uh, again, a lot of stuff in here. I would point out that paragraph 17, excuse me, paragraphs, well, paragraphs 16 and 17 talk about adjustments. And essentially what that means is anything that's owed on the property up to the date of the closing is the responsibility of the seller. Anything that's owed on the property after uh, the, the transfer is, is owned by the buyer. So what's important there is sometimes thing get, things get missed, like taxes. There could have been an outstanding tax lien that got missed. All of a sudden it pops up when you go down to town hall to change ownership uh, of the property or the, or the buyer goes to change ownership and they call you as the seller and say, hey, you owe me $20,000. Well, you'll be able to make those adjustments based on the closing date. Uh, and, and, and the proper person will pay for what's owed. 18 is your real estate commissions. So if you're now the seller of these properties and you hired a real estate commission, make sure that the percentage is correct uh, and make sure that it's not more than, than you agreed to pay. Um, cruising on through, again, you're gonna sign this document. Now, so you sign this document, the buyer goes through their due diligence with their lender. They get all their appraisers, and now they're gonna. Now you're gonna get to the closing table. The borrower is gonna call Crowd Lending or any lender, and this is important for you investors too. We're gonna produce a payoff sheet. Payoff statement is how much is owed at the time of the closing. So for you borrowers, things you wanna look for: make sure that the principal balance is correct. Make sure if there's any outstanding in interest, that's correct. And identify the dates of that outstanding interest. So for example, we don't have the dates on here. So I would, I would go back to my accounting department and I'll yell at them after this presentation. But there should be dates that says this $18,000 that you see here, that's from May 1st, uh, excuse me, from yeah May 1st through May 31st. Uh, that's how you accrued the $18,000. Then you've got some... Uh, lo uh, some payment loan payoff fees down the bottom, but make sure you really pay attention to the, to the payoff statement and make sure you have a full understanding because a lot of times it's more expensive to sell a house than you think. So I'm going to show you a settlement statement that we can go over some of that stuff, but a lot of times you misunderstand what's in a payoff statement and it can go in your, it can go in your favor or it could go not in your favor, but you have to make sure you have a full understanding of what's on that payoff statement. The last thing I'll point out to you is down the bottom underneath the big payoff number, the 2.219 is a daily interest amount. That number 626.39, that's your daily interest. So going back up to the top, this payoff is good through 531, but for a myriad of reasons, closings get pushed. So let's say this one got pushed to June 1st. You wouldn't have to come back to the lender and get a new payoff statement. You would just add that 626 to the $2.2 million number. And that would be your new payoff good through June 1st or June 2nd, however many days you've got to calculate. And again, important for our investors, because now we know that we're capturing every day that the loan is out, just because we issued a payoff statement good through 531, we have a mechanism by which we can capture the daily interest beyond that date without having to go back in and, and, and do additional work, which is you know, uh, time effective, more time effective for us. So now you're at the closing table. And this is the exact document that you saw at the beginning of the property, at the beginning of this uh, presentation when we bought the property. Now I want you to pay attention to the right side. And as you can see, there's a lot more numbers on the right side. 
So you've got your purchase price. Again, you'll make sure that that matches what was in the purchase and sale agreement. You've got a tax adjustment. This is what we talked about taxes are due quarterly. So if there's any sort of adjustment that needs to be made, that's gonna show up right there. And in this particular situation, this borrower or this seller had paid their second quarter taxes. So they actually got a credit back from the seller, from the buyer. You've got your payoffs to all your different banks here. This, this particular seller had a payoff to, two payoffs to Enterprise Bank. He also had another one on the following page. So he had a lot of payoffs that he had to, that he had to pay out uh, in order to sell this property. You've got excess deposits, which are deposits that were being held by the real estate agent. Usually what happens is the real estate agent collects the deposit. Let's say it's 5% of the purchase price. They will then net their fee from that, from that 5%. So a lot of times it's a wash. The buyer gave you 5%. The, the uh, real estate agent's taking 5%. So that net zeros. And at the end of the day, you would scroll down and uh, you would look at line 603, cash to seller. That's the bottom line that would be coming to you. In this particular case, this poor seller, seller despite the fact that he sold it for 1.5 million, he didn't get anything because he had to pay off all his lenders. He had to pay off his, his taxes. Uh, he had to pay his attorney's fees. Um, and you can see, as I stated earlier, you go to the third page here, you've got your additional seller payoffs. So he had a very big payoff to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for $1.3 million. I don't know why he had that. He had to pay that money, but he did. That's probably why he fought the, the sale was uh, the sale happened. So this settlement statement is essentially tells you all the money that's coming in, all the money that's going out, and all the money that's going to be left over when you sell this property. Now, what we like to see with our borrowers that sell properties is this line down here, cash a 603 cash to seller. We like to see big three digit numbers, a six digit numbers in that, in that line item, because that means they had a successful project. They paid us back. They took care of all their taxes and all their liabilities and they were able to put some money in their pocket. And inevitably, you know what they like to do with that money. They like to go out and buy another deal. They like to come back, borrow from us. We like to use our investors money. So we're paying our investors. The borrower is paying us and the borrower is making their money at the end of the sale. And it's just a big merry-go-round where everybody's making money. So with that being said, that's the life of a hard money loan. Uh, I'm going to move this over so you can see our uh, contact information. Um, our website is, I think for me anyway, it's behind our uh, faces over here, but it's www.crowdlending.com. That's a landing page that'll take you either from there. You can either jump off as an investor or you can jump off as a borrower. Um, we're located in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, so if you have any questions about our loan products or um, what we talked about today, we're happy to answer them now or we're happy to answer them uh, via email or uh, phone. Uh, I think that's it from our end. Awesome. Dan, that was amazing. This was, I mean, it opened up my eyes to all the work that's really put into the deals. And I mean, it, it's really cool to see this. I, I've never seen what the agreements look like and, you know, how the life of the loan would work. But uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up to some Q&A. So anyone, if you have questions, go ahead and type those in the Q&A section and we'll go ahead and answer them. Um, I've already got one in now. Is there an accepted schedule of work and draws by the industry? Uh, th there's nothing, there's no set uh, schedule. Every construction project moves at a different pace and every borrower moves at a different pace. What we really like to do is we'll break it down probably depending on the uh, size of the construction. Um, our, that $800,000 construction was a big one. That's probably eight to 10 visits, Hussein would you say? Yeah. But our average is probably $100,000 and we're probably breaking that down into three or four different visits over the course of a, of a four month period while they finish the work. And it does go in stages. It's, it's, framing, and, it's framing and roofing to the, and then windows and they get it weather tight and they move to the interior. They do the rough plumbing and the rough electrical. They get that done. Then they do the, uh, the insulation and the drywall. They get that done and they move on to finishes. So there is a sort of a cadence to the distributions uh, but there's no set schedule. 
to any of it. Uh, we have an in-house inspector that goes out and, and, and makes sure that the work is proceeding uh, as planned, um, but no, no two deals are the same. Yeah, I like that you have your own inspectors go out and double check the work and make sure it's quality. Um, that's pretty important for you know the investors making sure their, their money's secured. Um, all right, so we have a few more questions coming in. What is the level of the average investment from an IRA account? Uh, probably about 50,000 is probably about, I think our minimum is 10. Uh, but I think our average on that, uh, on that fund is about 50,000. Okay. And by the way, you do have to be an accredited investor to invest into this fund, correct? That's correct. Yes, sir. Um, all right. We got another question here. What's your average ROI? Uh, to our investors. Yeah. It bounces between about nine, nine and ten percent. Okay, uh, that's where we. That's and I think our average turns out to be somewhere nine point three three over the life of the fund. Uh, but we go between. We usually try to stay sort of. Uh, we're either at nine, nine and a half, or ten uh, on a quarterly distribution. Okay. Um, next question is: How long is most of the investment in your investments in your partnerships? So all of our loans are one year term. Uh, now that's not to say that we don't extend some of our borrowers given, you know, during COVID it was a, it was more of a, it was happening a lot more just because a lot of the uh, municipalities were shut down, but now we're seeing people get back on track, but there are times that we extend for three extra months or six extra months. So I would say on average, we're right at that year and all of our notes are written for a year. Uh, but there are times that we extend that. Okay. Um, any advice to anyone that wants to look into an investment like this? Maybe they're not an accredited investor, some due diligence tips you can give them. Yeah. I mean, I would start at our website. Uh, that's where I would start and click, go over to the crowd investor website. Um, you know, we don't cater to the uh, unaccredited investor. Uh, there are some uh, platforms out there that do. Uh, but again, I, I, it, it's really going to depend on doing your own due diligence and making sure that the risk profile is proper for whatever it is you're trying to do uh, and however much you're trying to invest. You know, we've, vet, we've sort of taken this risk in everything. And from our standpoint, the way that we're set up, we've mitigated a lot of that risk for our clients. But again, you got to be an accredited investor and a certain level of sophistication in order to be in the funds. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, where would somebody go to find the paperwork for the sub docs? Um, I don't know that they're up on the website, but you can email Amy at crowdlending.com and we can get those docs out to you. All right. You guys hear that? Amy at crowdlending.com. She's amazing. I've been communicating with her. She's quick to respond. Um, she'll get you whatever you need. If you need those sub docs, they'll review them and do due diligence. She will get them over to you. All right. Any other questions? Got a few more minutes here. Let's see. I'm going to check the chat. Nope. All right. Any, any last tips or things you want to put out there before we wrap it up? Uh, the only la my last thing that I would say is that, uh, you know, I've been in real estate uh, the better part of 15 years. Uh, we're in, a, we're in a, uh, an interesting time when it comes to real estate, but the markets that we are in, particularly in the Northeast, are pretty uh, insulated uh, from the ups and downs, given the, the uh, drivers that we have here, such as education and uh, life sciences and uh, hospitals. So I would, again, I think what I would leave everybody with is if you are considering using your, your self-directed IRA to invest in a real estate play, make sure A, that you like the real estate play and that it makes sense financially, but also that you're comfortable with the sponsors and the, and the operators of the business that, are, that you're gonna invest in because it is, it is somewhat of a two-part uh, due diligence uh, analysis. Yeah, hundred percent. Thank you guys again so much for joining us and spending some time, uh, you know, to educate our clients and we'll be posting this on our social media. Um, so if you guys want to stay tuned to our social media posts, you can follow us on YouTube. Um, also, if you have any questions, self-directed IRA questions, solo 401ks, health savings accounts, 
reach out to our IRA specialist. You can reach us at IRA specialist at newviewtrust.com. If you want to scan that QR code, you'll get alerts anytime we do new posts at, on YouTube or Facebook. Um, so that's the best way to stay up to date with uh, any new content. Um, thanks again, guys. I appreciate y'all taking the time. Um, and we'll definitely be in touch. Sounds thanks, good. everyone. Nice Thank to you. see you all next Wednesday, 1 p.m. Sounds good. Thank you.